the Sure Investing Podcast, investments and strategies to help you safely compound your wealth over the long run. The Sure Investing Podcast is hosted by Nick McCollum and supported by Sure Dividend, an investment newsletter provider aimed at helping people invest better through low-cost, long-term positions in individual securities. All opinions expressed by Nick and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Sure Dividend. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For more information about Sure Dividend and the research our firm provides, go to www.suredividend.com forward slash research. Today's conversation is with Dan Rasmussen and Nick Schmitz from Verdad Advisors. Verdad is an investment firm that seeks to capture private equity-like returns in the public market by quantitatively capturing the most important drivers of private equity returns. Surprisingly, these aren't the operational improvements that many private equity firms claim, but more fundamental factors like size, value, leverage, and the willingness to pay down debt. This conversation also includes a detailed discussion on Verdad's favorite international market and why capital allocation differences there make their strategy even more powerful. Please enjoy this conversation with Dan and Nick from Verdad Advisors. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks for having us on the the, the, the podcast, Nicholas. So, you know, I, I started uh, Verdad, really the, the, the strategy at a very, very simple origin, which is after after college, I went to work for Bain Capital Private Equity and, and private equity when I started in 09, the performance track record of the private of private equity as an asset class from 1980 to 2010 was just unbelievable. You know, 6% net of fees per year outperformance of the public equity market. Um, and at the same time, I was reading, you know, Jack Bogle and what works on Wall, uh, random walk down Wall Street and all these books. And I was like, well, all the evidence seems to show that active management doesn't work. Um, and yet I'm working in an industry, private equity, that where active management has not only worked, but worked dramatically and for the average manager. And I was at Bank Capital, which was one of the top managers. And so their own internal record was was even better. And it really led me to think, well, you know, what is driving the returns of private equity? You know, and I think that I, I, my instinct from reading, you know, Bogle and all these other um, books was that likely it wasn't the skill of the managers, right? It, it didn't, uh, it wasn't driven necessarily by us being that much smarter than the you know mutual fund guys at Fidelity or Putnam or anything. There was no special sauce, but rather there had to be something structural or systematic about private equity. And as we started to dig in, um, in, in 2011, I had this opportunity to work on this project, sort of dig into Bain Capital's returns and our competitors' returns um, and try to understand what worked and didn't work as part of a strategic review that Bain was doing. And what we found, which was really fascinating, was that, first of all, private equity is very, very different quantitatively than public equity, really on three dimensions. Uh, the first is size. So, you know, the average private equity deal is about $200 million of market cap versus, say, $30 billion for the S&P 500 constituents. So, really, private equity is a micro cap or small cap strategy. Second, every private equity deal is levered, uh, generally about 65% net debt to enterprise value. Versus public equities, which are generally unlevered or levered, maybe 10 percent net debt to enterprise value on average. And then third, that for there is a very, very strong correlation between purchase price and returns, such that the cheapest 25 percent of private equity deals explained over 60 percent of the industry's profits. And there was almost a direct, almost like a 90 percent uh, correlation between um, the uh, discount between private equity, the average purchase price paid by private equity, the average multiple paid by public equity, and how much the private equity vintage year outperformed. And so essentially, if you thought, well, from that perspective, it wasn't that the private equity managers were geniuses, is that they had been systematically buying 65% levered micro caps uh, at five or six times EBITDA, which was half the market valuation for 30 years. And that had worked astronomically well. But what has happened, and, and by 2011, this was very clear because it had really started in 0405, but by 2011 was totally true, is that looking at the historical returns of private equity, asset allocators had started to say, well, gee, this asset class has amazing returns. And they went and they talked to the private equity guys. They said, well, how are you making these returns? And the private equity said, well, you know, we do really deep diligence and we transform the companies that we own, which is an accurate view of how they spend their day-to-day job. And they never mentioned the fact that historically they've been buying 65% levered uh, micro caps for five, you know, 50% discount to the public equity valuations. 
And, and because there was no, that sort of quantitative anchor wasn't in the allocators' minds, they started pouring money into the asset class, which drove the prices up, such that by, you know, by 07, prices were pretty close to the public markets. And then since about 2010 on, they've been equal to, and now almost higher than public equity valuations. And my view is that private equity is extremely price sensitive, as, as we've discussed, and that if you're buying stuff at 10 times EBITDA, rather than five times EBITDA, your returns are going to be a lot lower. And in fact, it's I, my, my view from looking at the data was that at, at greater than 10 times EBITDA, you wouldn't beat the public equity market. So, so that uh, essentially because you'd be putting too much leverage, you know, 65% leverage at 10 times EBITDA, six and a half times EBITDA, which is, you know, bankruptcy risk territory. It's way too high. And so my view of 2010 was that as long as multiples were above 10 times EBITDA, private equity wouldn't outperform the public equity market because the quantitative drivers were what was driving it, not the genius of the manager. Um, and sure enough, you know, from 2010 on, private equity has underperformed the public equity markets by about a percent or two a year. And so the magic of private equity turned out not to have been diligent skill or operational transformation, but rather this quantitative profile, which was so excellent. And, and when I sort of realized this at Bank Capital, I said, well, gee, I could do this much more effectively and systematically and focus all of my intellectual energy on the um, stock selection process and the sort of intellectual aspects of building an investment strategy rather than deal sourcing and process, et cetera. And so I left Bain to go to Stanford GSB um, to sort of test this quantitatively, in, in essence, to work with Charles Lee, who was a, one of the top finance professors at Stanford, and Brian Chingono, who, who is not on the call, but he um, uh, was at, at Chicago at the time. He's our director of quantitative research, and he was working with Robert Vishney at the University of Chicago. And we said, what we want to do is basically look at the universe of U.S. companies that have traded at less than seven times EBITDA, greater than 50 percent lever, and more small to micro caps, and see if the returns on that class of equities look similar to the gross of fee returns of private equity. Um, and what we found is that it did, and that all the sort of insights that we'd had from our, our initial hypothesis about the importance of valuation and its interaction with leverage were all true. And so, in essence, what you could do is build portfolios of you know these small, cheap, you know, levered companies that looked like 1980s or 1990s LBOs and would have returns that looked like 1980s or 1990s LBOs, rather than the the sort of high-priced, over-levered mediocrity that is the private equity industry today. So that was sort of the intellectual genesis of Verdad. And what we then started to do is, you know, I'd worked at Bridgewater before, and my view is that, you know, you don't want to just prove that something works. You want to replicate it across multiple market cycles and across time. So we'd seen that it worked in private equity. We'd seen that it worked in public equities in the U.S. back to 1965. And so we said, well, what's the next big market and, and uh, that we could test? And Japan is, you know, the second biggest equity market in the world. And so we decided to test it in Japan back to 1991. And we ran uh, that study and found fantastic results, totally replicated what we'd done. Uh, but there was this totally bizarre anomaly, uh, which was that in Japan, the volatility of the strategy was dramatically lower and so at that point, I was like, this does not make any sense. And I was like, how can I figure out how this could possibly be true? And I thought of uh, Nick, who's my you know, best friend from business school. And Nick um, uh, speaks fluent Japanese. We met literally on day one at Stanford. Nick was working at Goldman covering Japanese clients. So I called Nick up and I said, Nick, you know, help me figure this out. You know, you know the Japanese market really well. Like, Hey, like, can you look at the numbers and see if they're right? Um, and then can you help me figure it out? And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Nick to sort of talk about uh, that. Uh, yeah, as Dan said, I uh, we met day one at uh, the Stanford GSB Business School. We were, you know, we both sat through Charles Lee and just Petrosky's classes together. And prior to business school, um, I had a sort of a circuitous route. Um, I was uh, in the Marines uh, as an infantry officer after graduate school studying philosophy in England. And then uh, following that, I went back to teach on faculty, um, on the political science faculty. And then I went to business school where I met Dan. And, and you know, after business school, as Dan said, I joined, uh, joined Goldman. And uh, among a lot of other things, I, I, I had a little bit of coverage of Japanese clients, essentially, um, because I had a background and it. it was my minor and I'd spent a lot of time there, both the military and, and on my own. And um, Dan came to me on, on the Japan Brian, our, our, our current partner who joined at the beginning of this year full time, uh, he they had been working on the out of sample replication test in Japan, 
Um, and Dan called me one day and essentially said, told me, hey, he had, he had submitted the uh, results of the out-of-sample replication test to the journalist covering them at the Financial Times. And they wrote back and told him the data must be wrong because the volatility was way too low. And so Dan kind of called me after checking the numbers and said, hey, this um, this looks like it really makes sense. I checked the numbers. They're right. And so we spent about eight months going back and forth trying to figure out how the heck it was uh, possible to get a, you know, a sharp of, of, of one, 1. 1.2 on a long only strategy in Japan for a levered small value. And in a nutshell, you know, our, our specialty at Verdad is, um, you know, we, we invest in small, cheap and levered companies, generally very high free cash flow yield that, that, uh, that resemble the quantitative characteristics of a 1980s LBO. And as Dan will explain, the number one risk control concern he has in the, either the U.S. or the European market um, is bankruptcy, um, of avoiding bankruptcy. And there's a variety of risk control rules he can use to do that. But if you can figure out which companies are going to pay down debt versus which are going to have solvency issues within the universe of levered companies, then you have the golden key to disaggregating the, the, the future returns of levered equities. Now, that's very, very different in the Japanese environment, because it's the one country, uh, developed market country, with the, the lowest bankruptcy risk in publicly listed equities. There was one company last year went bankrupt out of 3,500 publicly listed equities. And so if you take our kind of niche approach to levered equities in markets with high yield debt, mar in, in high yield debt markets in those geographies, and you transition it over to the even more niche application in the Japanese environment, the, the, the risk profiles of the outcomes on that are just radically different. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why that phenomenon is so unique in Japan and why that financing backdrop um, exists. But it's just it's one it's 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 one of the best environments uh, to, to execute our particular niche strategy in, internationally. So you guys have a global investment focus. I'm curious as to what proportion of your fund, I guess, would be in Japan and then also uh, to spin off of that. What, I guess, are the underpinnings as to why, I guess, culturally and financially, your strategy tends to work so well in the country of Japan? Yeah. So in terms of, you know, we have we, we, we have two uh, funds. We run a global fund and a Japan fund. Uh, and the global fund is, you know, a third Europe, a third North America and a third Japan. And essentially, because the correlations are relatively limited between small value stocks in Europe, Japan, and the U.S., that that provides a wonderful diversification benefit, and it's a, it's really nice to combine three you know less correlated return streams. But you know what we discovered is that Japan, you know, for the reasons that Nick described, is it, and and he can go into sort of the most attractive of those markets because of the dramatically lower. At risk, um, and so we launched a dedicated uh, Japan fund, which is obviously 100% Japan. And that fund now, um, in in just uh, a few months, has actually driven uh, grown to be the same size as our global fund. So, uh, and Nick can talk about sort of why Japan is is so special. So the, the the bankruptcy is obviously a huge part. That is just if you can reduce the aggregate probability of bankruptcy in a portfolio of levered stocks, you essentially cut out the entire bottom quartile of, of performers in that portfolio. So as whereas in the US or Europe, where they do have high yield debt markets, you'll see dramatic bottom quartile results relative uh, to a top quartile that dramatically outperforms the market in levered equities. Now, in Japan, we, we, we see a similar upper quartile uh, performance, not quite as extreme, but the lower quartile is actually has uh, both quantitatively and what we've seen in live trading is is um, actually reduced risk relative. It tracks the the small caps in general or the small cap index in Japan, which has less volatility than the Nikkei or the topics. And so that makes it just a very, very unique application of our strategy. And then the the other reason which we've tried to prove quantitatively as to why the strategy back tests so well and seems to be um, working quite well um, in live trading, is the really unique thing about Japan is for many investor who's um, looked at it, and everybody knows this, um, and it's been the strategy that every activist fund has tried to target in Japan, is Japan is the worst capital allocation market internationally from shareholders' perspective. You know, whether it's improved marginally in the last few years, it's a bit of a drop in the bucket. Um, if you just benchmark the average cash used by Japanese companies as a percentage of revenue to pay dividends or do share buybacks or various other things that could be beneficial to uh, to shareholders. It's just way lower in Japan on the whole. 
And so every every fund, especially the activists over the last 20 years who have looked at this data have said, aha, this is an opportunity. If we can either select the companies that are going to be shareholder friendly within Japan or get management to change their ways and be more shareholder friendly, then we've cracked the code of one of the most inefficient um, markets from a shareholder's perspective. We, we agree with the exact same problem in the Japanese environment as that everybody else recognizes. We just don't think from the track record of most activist funds in Japan that the execution is it's de- certainly doable, but it's much more difficult to come in as a, um, a, a foreigner, a gaijin, um, a, a Westerner particularly, and convince Japanese boards to change their philosophy of, 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 of how they uh, of capital allocation for shareholders. And so what we do and what we found quantitatively as well is if you take the universe of levered Japanese firms uh, and compare that to the majority of Japanese firms that are, have very cash-heavy balance sheets, um, we, ju- we generally see better capital allocation behavior from a shareholder's perspective within the subset of the market that is levered, i.e. that's the only universe we really select from in our fund. And so in a sense, the other kind of driver of our returns other than the re- reduced bankruptcy rate is the fact that the companies we select from are being supervised by the banks not to hoard cash on the balance sheet or invested in um, different projects, whether it's you know, M&A pipe dreams or uh, empire building. Uh, at the expense of shareholders. Um, our companies um, generally want to pay down debt and uh, they don't have the opportunity to squander the corporate the, the company's cash uh, for purposes that are not in the interest of shareholders. And so that is that's an incremental reason. I, I, I'd almost look at our, our quantitative strategy as a form of passive activism um, in Japan. So that that's one of the things that makes it um, particularly unique in that environment as well. This idea of capital allocation is really fascinating when it comes to your strategy because Outside of the, I guess, core three concepts, which are size, value, and leverage, a really close fourth would be the propensity to pay down debt. So, I, you know, I've done some reading and I see you guys have done work on how to predict what companies are going to pay down debt in the next year and in the years after that. So can you talk a little bit about that predictive uh, procedure, I guess? Yeah, and, and size, value, and leverage, I mean, in some sense, um, are all contributors to the main driver of our returns, leverage right i mean they're, they're almost uh uh you know they're the legs of the stool and but the stool is debt pay down that's how we make money and the way you know if you if you think about it conceptually right you know the way to make money is for things to go the, the way to make a lot of money in investing is for things that go from really bad to only kind of bad and so if you think about buying really cheap companies that have a lot of debt on the balance sheet that then pay off their debt Right, they're sort of naturally getting better. They're less likely to default. Um, their financial health has improved, and if they pay down 100 million of debt, just capital structure theory says that equity accounts should increase 100 million uh, if Medigliani Miller holds. So you should get many, many benefits from debt pay down. Um, and in effect, you know, in, in reality, you know, if you think about investors who are focused on dividends or buybacks, right? It's great to get money back, but you know, deleveraging is more beneficial than dividends or buybacks because, in addition to you getting the money back, or, or at least by proxy through you know the pay down of the debt, the equity is going up. You get all these other ancillary benefits of the improved health of the of the company. And what's also really cool is that while everybody can calculate a, a dividend yield, right? You, you know, you can calculate a dividend yield. Yahoo Share, you know, will do it. For your, you know, do it for you. You know, very few people can actually calculate a deleveraging yield. Even though it's quite simple, you know, you just take the amount of debt a company paid off in the past year, you know, divide it by the current market cap, and that's your sort of deleveraging yield. Um, and we're really buying companies that have a deleveraging yield of fifteen or twenty percent. And so these are companies that are paying down a lot of debt fast. And what we found is that we can predict deleveraging really well. It's not as predictable as dividends, but it's a heck of a lot more predictable than earnings growth. And the simplest way, you know, if you start with, you know, what are the, what are the, what, are, how do you, how do you predict the leveraging? It's very simple. You say, well, how much debt did they pay down last year? And that's going to be your baseline for how much they're going to pay down in the next year. And there are things that are going to color your projection, like, you know, basically more profitable companies are more likely to pay down debt than less profitable companies. Um, companies where, uh, the interest cover ratio, for example, um, is um, you know where, where they have great interest coverage ratio are much more likely to pay down debt. Right? Any 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 metric that looks at cash flow generation um, relative to the amount of debt or relative to the amount of equity 
um, is going to improve the likelihood of debt pay down. Um, just so again, it's just mechanical, right? You have to generate cash to pay down debt. And so you look at the ratio of the cash generation, the amount of debt outstanding, the amount of equity outstanding, and that's how you figure out you know, how much debt is going to be paid down and then what the magnitude of the impact that's going to have on the equity valuation. And what we've done actually to improve our predictor of accuracy is Brian, who's our director of quantitative research, took all the financial you know, data in, from 1965 uh, to 2013, I believe, and did a you know machine learning algorithm on it. And they said, you know, predict the likelihood of debt pay down one year forward based on one year ago financials. Uh, and we found that we can get to about 70% accuracy with that machine learning uh, tool. And it's built on a lot of the same, you know, the key drivers of it are the ones I just described. But we find that by using that sort of Bayesian model, it, it really um, enhances our decision-making ability. And what's really cool is that it's a very, like if you look at our, uh, at our back tests, right? Um, the companies that we predict are much more likely to pay down debt do end up predicting uh, paying down debt and they end up paying down more debt and their equity returns are higher. So there's a direct sort of logical connection between what we're trying to do and what ends up happening that I think is sort of for us the, the sort of um, uh, most satisfying thing to see. When it comes to quantifying the other three main factors in the strategy, size, value, leverage, how do you guys uh, compute those factors? Yeah, so, you know, I think in terms of you now size is size matters in some places and not in others. Um, and so it's one of our less important variables. But it, it, when we would think of size, uh, both in terms of market cap and in terms of traded volume, um, and in some cases, traded volume is actually a better predictor than size. It seems like the sort of stocks that are, you know, less paid attention to, lower turnover in, in, in the U.S. and Japan, at least, are, you know, more attractive. Um, you know, in Europe, it's a little bit different. But the ones that are really at the core of our strategy are leverage uh, value and then probability of debt pay down or historical debt pay down. Um, we calculate leverage uh, very simply as net debt to enterprise value. Uh, and we want a higher percentage leverage. Um, we calculate uh, value uh, as enterprise value uh, divided by EBITDA. Um, so we're looking for low multiples of EBITDA. We'll also look at other multiples like EBIT multiples and price to book multiples um, to you know, add some nuance to the value signal. But what that combines to lead you to is you know, companies that have roughly in our portfolio, say, trade at six times enterprise value to EBITDA, have about three times net debt to EBITDA. Um, and that's sort of the sweet spots for our strategy. And, and broadly from there, obviously, if we can get if we can buy stuff at four times EBITDA, which we can in Japan, but it's hard elsewhere, um, we'd prefer to do that. And if we could get a higher percentage leverage, we'd like that. Um, but the thing with, and, and then of course we want the deleveraging yield. So we want, not only are they cheap and levered, but they've been paying down a lot of debt and the quantum of debt paid down is high relative to the equity value and the amount of debt they have on the balance sheet. So all those things work together. We've also found, um, you know, there are a, a ton of, we, sh we should get into it separately, um, a, a lot of ways to sort of mitigate risk um, in that universe. Because if you think about, if you're buying the smallest, cheapest, most highly levered stocks in the world, which is what we do, you know, you're also um, going to pick up a lot of stocks which are uh, on the path to bankruptcy. And so you have to really focus a lot on how to uh, control for that risk uh, and not that you, you can't just buy the smallest, cheapest, most highly levered things. You're going to get too many uh, dogs in there. Um, so there has to be other other elements of your, your process as well to control for those uh, risks. But that's sort of the core of the engine. That's a nice segue into what my next question was going to be, because when it comes to the leverage factor, there has to be diminishing returns. Buying companies with a 99% net debt to EBITDA, that's probably a recipe for disaster on average. So I guess, how do you mitigate the risk that comes specifically from the leverage factor, but also from the strategy as a whole? Sure. So um, a few things. So first, debt. So, you know, sort of the consensus academic wisdom, right, is that debt is bad, right? That the more debt you have, you know, the worse your equity returns are going to be. And there is a uh, logic to that, um, and there is empirical evidence to support it, and we would agree with that. And if you think about debt relative to profits, debt relative to cash flow, or debt relative to EBITDA, the more debt you put on the balance sheet of a company, the higher the risk of bankruptcy, the worse the equity outcomes are going to be. Um, however, uh, if you think about debt as a percentage of the capital structure – 
just logically, right? If you if you're running a portfolio that's zero percent levered, or has a portfolio that's fifty percent levered, you know the fifty percent levered portfolio, just you know basic capital structure theory, should do twice as good. You know, twice, you know, because you know your your equity is now levered one to one uh, as opposed to being completely unlevered. And the more leverage you can get, the higher the dispersion of outcomes are going to be, right? If you can buy something that's ninety percent levered and that has just a ten percent equity sliver, you know your dispersion of outcomes in that name are going to be very high. Um, and in equity markets, high dispersion is very good because uh, you can lose your money only once and you can make your money up, you know, six or seven times. Uh, and so, you know, what you then want to then think about, right, is uh, if you, you have those two sort of competing impulses, right, you, you want high percentage leverage and you want low absolute leverage. And, and that's why, you know, we talk so much about value and leverage interacting, right? It's so important to buy really cheap things that are very nicely levered on a percentage basis, um, but where the absolute leverage of, level of leverage is low. Um, and so that's that's sort of how we think about the just the general problem of leverage. Um, the other way to reduce sell leverage, as Nick uh, will tell you, is just go to Japan where there's no bankruptcy risk at all. So, you know, the more debt, you know, who cares? It doesn't make any difference to, to the risk of the strategy, which is one of the reasons we love uh, Japan so much. You know, when you then think, you know, what are the ways then in addition to that um, to uh, control for the risk of bankruptcy, which is, other than just going to Japan where there isn't bankruptcy, what are the ways in which you can control for bankruptcy? Um, and that's what we spend a lot of our quantitative um, research focused on and a lot of our screening. And some of the biggest predictors are sort of interesting. So, so of course, there's credit rating, right? If something has a C credit rating, it's very likely to go bankrupt. And, and, we, so, and, and we'll basically take the inputs into the credit ratings models and we run those ourselves. So we, you know, even if something isn't rated, you know, we generally know what the rating should be and we'll eliminate anything that C has a C rating. And then next, one of the interesting metrics that works, you know, really well in the U.S. and Europe is the short interest. So shorts are smart. If short shorting a small value stock uh, that's looked really cash generative, chances are they're doing so because they have some pretty good knowledge about how fast the business is trading and the probability of bankruptcy. Uh, and so, if you eliminate um, a most highly shorted stocks from your universe, you have dramatic reductions in risk and dramatic increases in returns. Um, and so, but if you you know think about you know those as probably two of the tools, and then I think the third tool is just carefully watching you know momentum. You know, uh, stock prices do predict future fundamentals, and so you know if a stock is down fifty percent in the last uh, six months, chances are next quarter isn't going to be too hot. Um, and so, as you're buying that stock, you want to be buying that slowly to make sure that you're um, you're getting all of the latest information. You're not sort of catching a falling knife. Uh, and so those are sort of the major uh, risk controls we use, which first are the sort of things that you can calculate based on historical financials. You know, second, we'll be paying attention to short interest. And then third, um, using momentum rules I I as we trade um, such that we don't sort of catch these falling knife type scenarios. This idea of the strategy being de-risked to an extent in Japan is really fascinating to me. And I want to ask whether or not the essentially 0% interest rate policy there has any impact on that. Yeah, so that, that that's actually a really, um, really fascinating question. I mean, that's been in place since 1998. The Japanese really pioneered it. You would think it would, and one of the number one questions we get is, you know, what if that changes? Um, and certainly that would probably have some impact, although uh, the caveat I would give to that is I don't think what most people realize is Japan is so cheap relative to the U.S. Uh, the Nikkei trades at about uh, a little over eight times EBITDA, whereas the S&P trades around 12 or 13 times. And, you know, our companies are trading um, somewhere usually between four to five times EBITDA on average. Um, and so at that, at that, those valuations, you really only need, you know, one to two turns of debt on a, a, a two turns of debt, a, a two times EBITDA worth of debt on a um, four times EBITDA company to get a 50% levered capital structure. Well, two turns of debt is not that much debt at all. Your average LBO is about six turns of debt. And so um, I think where people might miss the boat on this question about if interest rates did increase, they would have to significantly increase um, to cause any solvency risk uh, to, to Japanese companies, even just assuming they operated in the same way that U.S. companies do with refinancing ability to refinance with the banks over there. Um, assuming that, it would have to be a significant increase in interest rates for the interest coverages ratios to deteriorate significantly enough to cause solvency risk. 
And, you know, that's, you know, our average company plays about 75 basis points on the, on the debt they get from the main banks in Japan. Uh, and, you know, that is you know, significantly lower than the U.S., even if the, the Japanese interest rates went up significantly, even 300, 400, 500 basis points. These are still mildly levered companies on an absolute basis that happen to be cheap enough to match the capital structure leverage ratios that a typical LBO would. Is there an argument to be made for the other side of the coin? So I guess higher interest rates would incentivize Japanese capital allocators to pay their debt down more quickly, which would strengthen the impact of your strategy. Yes, in theory, although you, uh, we, are, we are never um, unsurprised when we visit Japanese companies to find the um, capital allocation logic of the CEOs or the CFOs of the company. It does not match what you would expect from a Western perspective. In business school, there's an optimal capital allocation theory that, you know, at a certain amount of debt with certain interest rates, you know, your weighted average cost of capital is X, and it would ideally make sense to take out more debt if interest rates are more favorable or take out less if they're not. Um, in Japan, this is just for 90% of um, corporate management teams in Japan. This is, especially in the small cap world, this is not the logic that's that's going through their head. We'll visit the companies and ask them, Hey, you know, you have you have uh, two turns of debt. You're not that levered. You know, you're paying 75 basis points on it. Do you want to pay down debt? Oh, yeah, we definitely want to pay down debt. And we say, well, well, heavens, why would you want to do that? It's you essentially have a free credit card from the bank. Are, are they being mean to you? And they say, oh, no, you know, we violated every single one of their covenants uh, two years ago, and they offered us more debt at a lower interest rate. And so, you know, we're just and we're, you know, from uh, and we we are the natural question for us, you know, going through Western business school and learning optimal capital allocation is, well, then why the heck do you want to pay this debt down so much? And, you know, it's it, you know, it usually comes down to a lot of the same philosophy. And it's not we're not making a judgment, normatively judgmental claim here. But, you know, a lot of Japanese corporate management is much more concerned uh, less so with shareholder returns or optimal capital allocation than the longevity of the business or the happiness of the employees or um, this, the, the impact they're making to society. Um, it's much less, um, I think, aggressive financially than your typical U.S. CEO or CFO would be. And so we see a lot of kind of bizarre behavior where I don't know that that relationship would necessarily hold uh, the same way it would if you applied interest rate change to U.S. CEOs. Can you maybe give us an example of what a company in the Japanese portfolio would look like? Uh, sh sure. Uh, our typical, com just statistically, and then I I'm happy to go into um, an example or two, but statistically, our average company is um, uh, today is about 4.8 uh, times EBITDA, about 40, 45% uh, net debt to enterprise value. Um, we hold about 40 of them, 35 to 40 at any given time. The average market cap is um, going to be somewhere around um, um, 700 million, although the median's lower. Um, that's because there's some bigger ones in there. Um, and typically, they they pay down about um, seven percent of their net debt balance um, from the previous year. You know that said, um, they're pretty they're spread out. Uh, we do everything except for um, you know financials, banks, and then we generally will avoid real estate. It's just a general rule of thumb that Dan and I have is if we don't really understand. Um, how it's valued, and it's an anomaly in terms of um, valuations from the the rest of the universe of companies in that world. We 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 stay out of it if we don't understand it. Um, and I think banks and and uh, to some degree real estate firms um, fit that. So what you'll see um, in our universe um, in Japan, particularly industry concentrations, a little bit different, especially in the cheap realm. Um, you'll see uh, more so. Um, the Japanese auto supply chain, um, that's a very cheap industry, um, groups near the top of our looks most attractive, um, at least to a computer. Um, but, you know, we, we apply some, uh, we apply, apply limits to our industry. So you'll really only see about 10% of any one um, industry on the lower order. So, you know, like auto supply chains, grocery, uh, you know, consumer retail, chemicals. Um, those sort of classifiers, you won't really see more of the fund be any more really than about 10%. Um, and so it's a, a, a very diversified group of um, different industries, excluding financials and, and mostly real estate um, that you'll see within our portfolio. And I think, you know, it might be, it might be worth um, talking about just to, to illustrate 
I think some of the, the perhaps some of the most uh, people often ask how our companies became levered, right? Which is uh, always an interesting question. And, and Nick, you know, I, I, I thought maybe you know there are a few different examples like you know Ishihara or Yamaya um, or oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, or uh, um, uh, that might be you know worth talking through, or maybe one of the ones that has done some horrible capital allocation. As those are probably our three most common. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned um, Yamaya was one of those. Um, uh, we were invested in before, at least from the beginning, um, but um, that was one of the, our smaller names, but a very interesting one. That was a, um, a liquor and restaurant roll-up. Um, uh, they were a former uh, Carlisle portfolio company, or at least um, the liquor store they bought out were, and um, you know, so they were levered um, after being uh, under uh, under a sponsor um, in Japan. Um, and that's, you know, that's one reason why a company might have been, um, might be levered at the time we're looking at it. They just get out um, from a, a sponsor or a private equity ownership. Uh, you know, another one was, um, other reasons they might do it is they made just a horrible boneheaded capital allocation decision. Um, one of the companies, um, a chemical company we're involved in, not Ishihara, but um, they decided to build a factory in Malaysia um, on an island um, where nobody spoke um local language and they couldn't get any Japanese people to. And it was just one of the worst um, kind of boondoggles. And it was um, completely unprofitable. And they took out a lot of debt as a result of it um, and had vowed, you know, uh, to never do that again ever since that. So you'll see, I think about, I would estimate about a third to um, 50 percent of our companies have made some sort of really bad um, capital allocation decision in the past that as a result they needed to um, take out either to execute that capital allocation decision. They needed to take out a loan from the bank, or subsequent to execute to that project, um, they had to take out a loan to sustain themselves in the interim. Um, and so, there's a lot of I think half the companies we we go and eventually meet with. Um, it's more like we joke that it's more like walking into a confessional um, than to kind of a corporate pitch. And you know, half of the discussion is we're, we're sorry for what we did two years ago. Um, we're very focused on delevering. Uh, there's a new CEO, and we 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 you know we learned our lessons from from that decision that resulted in our leverage. Now, um, more Ishihara, like you said, it was a massive environmental liability um, that they had they had to take had to take out debt to get through. Um, so those those are all the various different reasons um, why. But you usually um, looking forward, they they kind of regret what happened in the past. With this focus on Japanese stocks, how do you guys think about currency risk? Do you hedge it or do you leave it unhedged? Oh, um, we don't. Um, our, our one, I think, our, our investors, if they re, if they have strong um, directional views on the yen, um, they can choose to hedge. So one is just practical; it's easier for them to do that. And two, I mean, we our own money. We 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 don't want it hedged in Japan, particularly if it were any other con- country. Um, it might be a different um, debate. But we found a very there. You know, there is a very long period of time, and yes, it could break. But there's a strong inverse correlation between equities and the yen dollar rate, um, such that when a U.S. dollar investor is doing well on currency, um, usually um, Japanese equities are doing very um, poorly and vice versa. So when we test this over very long periods of time, um, being unhedged in Japan for FX has significantly um, reduced the volatility and the drawdowns of the strategy. Um, and, you know, yet, yes, it could break, um, you know, um, that that's definitely a possibility. And, um, you know, we don't, um, I, I don't, I, I don't necessarily know that, um, it would be wise to bet the strategy on that happening. Um, but, um, for the last 20 years or so, um, and, you know, um, subsequently, um, during live trading just in February, um, you know, this was, um, following the rhyme of history when it comes to Japanese FX was, has at least been the right decision. Um, and so it's good to see it work in, in real trading as well. Um, on, you know, on the dailies, um, it's very, very predictable. You can almost run in a regression of, um, the Nikkei's performance and just include the variable of how, the, how well the S and P 500 did and the FX movement and ex- explain about 90% of its daily trading movement. Um, and then, you know, on monthlies and yearlies, there's also a pretty strong correlation. So, um, we do, we definitely like the, da- the, the volatility damping characteristics of, um, of being unhedged for FX in Japan. That is fascinating. I had no idea about that phenomenon. What about other currencies? You know, we don't hedge uh, other currencies either. Um, uh, they're not, um, you know, the yen has that sort of special flight to safety dynamic, which is so helpful. 
Other currencies don't necessarily uh, have that, uh, but our view is that you know the currency um, exposure is part of the uh, diversifying benefits of investing abroad. Um, and since we don't have a directional view on currency, the costs of hedging are probably you know worse than the benefits to us. I want to circle back now and talk about the operational implementation that private equity managers tend to claim when they talk about the sources of the returns. So I've read that you guys have done a lot of empirical research into whether or not private equity managers actually have the capability to improve the performance of their companies. Can you talk a little bit about that and why it led you to believe that private equity performance actually comes from size, leverage, and value? Sure. You know, well, I think, first of all, there's no magical way to improve companies' operating performance. I mean, if there was a playbook, um, you know, everybody would use it, you know. I, I mean, companies are just complex things. There's no perfect strategy. You know, it's not like, you know, if you've gone to Harvard Business School, you know, you're granted the magic wizard wand and then any company you walk into magically improves EBITDA margins by a full percent. It's just not the way the world works, right? Um, uh, things are too stochastic and complex. So I think that the idea um, that private equity firms would have some sort of uh, systematic operational improvement, right? That either the companies that are bought by private equity start to grow faster than other companies or their margins systematically improve. You know, my sort of a priori hypothesis would have been that seems unlikely, uh, especially since most of the people that work in private equity are, you know, former investment bankers, um, not uh, company operators, right? They're, 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 this is not like the VC world where the VCs are all entrepreneurs, right? Most, most, most private equity guys or investment bankers. And, you know, do you want your investment banker running your laundromat or something? You know, probably not. Their skill sets are, are doing deals, capital structure, uh, not necessarily margin improvement or revenue growth um, uh, or product market fit or whatever. Um, and so, you know, but to test this, you know, what, 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 what we did is we, we looked, we basically built a data set of every private equity deal that had been financed with public debt. Um, and what, what's special about public debt is that, or, you know, bonds essentially is that um, when you issue a bond, you have to report the financials, you know, prior to the bonds being issued, and you have to report uh, regularly to your bondholders. And so essentially the private equity deals that are fun financed with public debt have financial level data, both pre and post acquisition. And so you can say, well, let's look at all these uh, transactions and see what the difference in operating metrics are pre acquisition and post acquisition. Um, and what you find is that on average for a private equity transaction, um, revenue growth slows, uh, margins are essentially flat. Um, and so, you know, there's not a huge difference on those metrics. Um, but what does happen, uh, unsurprisingly, is debt goes way up, interest payments goes way up and CapEx goes down. Um, and so basically the goal of private equity is to affect a change in capital structure to enable, in essence, to create these levered opportunities um, and any operational um, improvement, quote unquote, that follows from that um, is largely, you know, I think this sort of discipline of debt idea, right? That by having debt, it means that you won't spend money on stupid capital expenditures, um, that you, uh, you know, will be more frugal on costs. Um, I think that broad, broadly, most American companies are running pretty efficiently, pretty lean and mean already. So there's not a lot of low-hanging fruit that just putting debt on the balance sheet will solve. There is in Japan. That's another issue. Um, probably, yes, a company is not going to invest as much in CapEx. And statistically, we see that when they're levered. And the quantitative research suggests that most capital spending is is uh, you know, uh, bad um, or you know, essentially the higher the investment, the, the worse the equity returns. So you know, there is some 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 logic uh, to that. Um, but none of this is uh, none of this uh, is flowing from anything other than the change in capital structure. Um, there, there's no um, there's no you know magic wizard wand that the private equity, you know, some secret book uh, held in the bowels of Blackstone that reveals how to make companies much better um, that nobody else knows or understands. You also mentioned earlier and I forgot to ask this question at the time, but you know, massive inflows into private equity have brought up valuations and kind of ruined their returns. So with that in mind, would you say that the Verdad strategy is capacity constrained as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we think that broadly, you know, every asset manager um, makes a choice between making Ferraris um, and making Toyotas. Nick and I and Brian, you know, we want to build Ferraris. You know, we we, we want we, we think of ourselves as craftsmen. Um, we love 
we love building really beautiful things that work really well. Um, and we're okay with not producing that many of them. Um, we don't want to sort of mass produce something. And our view is that mass produced active products, you know, the sort of large capacity active products are going to have a really hard time competing with index funds. Um, whereas the opportunities for investors for active management, we think is in the niche and the unexplored and the um, off the beaten path. Um, and, you know, you think about what we specialize in, which is levered companies, which nobody else really does. Um, and then specifically in Japan, which really nobody else does. Um, you know, we are about as off the beaten path as you could possibly get. Uh, and our view is that we want to, you know, stay in our little niche, which we know really well and produce excellent, you know, return streams. Um, but we're never going to manage $50 billion. You know, we might never even manage a billion dollars. Um, our strategies uh, are so capacity constrained. Um, but we, you know, we, we really um, uh, love doing that. We love what we do. We love, you know, proving that our ideas work in live trading. Um, and that's, I think, intrinsically satisfying over and above, you know, the, the sort of reward of managing billions of dollars, which I think is not necessarily our goal. This whole idea for Verdad has been the culmination of really like, a decade of work almost by now. And I'm curious, is there any other field of research that has you excited right now that could potentially be a new strategy for Verdad in the future? You know, we, we do, you know, we spend so much time on every little aspect of our strategy. So, you know, if you think about what today, you know, Brian is working on replicating all of our work in Europe. Um, uh, and Nick has been working on uh, essentially looking at each quarter when we trade how much do we want to rebalance? How, you know, how low does the rank have to be to sell versus how high? You know, how how does how do those dynamics affect trading? And so I think we've got a long ways just on optimizing our current strategies. Um, all of these are such important research projects to work on. Um, you know, I, I could see us launching a, a Europe dedicated fund. Um, I think that's something that we we, we definitely have on our, our roadmap. Um, but other than that, I think we really want to sort of stick to our our knitting. Um, uh, and focus on things that are narrowly within our circle of competence. Um, there are other things that I love to read about. Um, I love reading about uh, and talking to my friends that do short selling. I find it endlessly fascinating. Um, but, you know, I look at the level of expertise. You know, they've put in decades of research to come good at what they do. Um, I don't see us, you know, putting a decade in to develop a strategy that's not, you know, directly contiguous to what we do. This is a nice segue to talk about learning because I love asking people who work in intellectually stimulating fields like you two both do about what their learning process looks like and what they like to read. And so I guess I'll start, I guess, with a question from Ted Sides that he likes to ask people. And that is, uh, what research do you like to read that people would be surprised to find out that you read? Or it doesn't have to be research. It could be a book or a periodical or what have you. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm going to turn this question over to Nick because largely, uh, you know, Nick is actually a, uh, was a professor uh, prior to uh, uh, working for, for, for Dad. And so uh, uh, for the past two years or so, I've, I've been on the Nick Schmidt's uh, philosophy boot camp uh, reading list. Uh, so I've just been reading things that Nick has been recommending, uh, but, 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 but his, his reading list is pretty interesting. So uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Nick. Sure. And um with the caveat that um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an extremist on this, so um, it's not definitely. I wouldn't recommend that it's the way to go with everyone. But you know, I, I was, I used to teach, and the students would, you know, turn in papers, and um, you know, the, one of the first things you'd check is the, um, you know, the sourcing of what they're, where they're actually getting their information from, whether it's you know Wikipedia or some secondary opinion article or you know actual primary data, and inevitably the most original papers and the most insightful conclusions were directly correlated with the amount of primary sourcing um, that the students used. It's almost a surefire thing. And I found the, you know, some of the worst papers where they just looked up a, you know, their favorite uh, opinion uh, journalist in the column that happened to be related to the, in a popular paper and just repeated what they said. Um, and, you know, so I, I generally, um, I actually try to um, block out most of the the secondary source opinion pieces, although it, it is helpful to not reinvent the wheel on stuff, but I generally err almost exclusively to primary sources. And for, for the quantitative overlay portion of that, that's data. Um, so I, I do um, spend a, a disproportionate amount of my time looking at Bank of Japan data, looking at um, bankruptcy rates, looking at um, the entire universe of, um, of, um, of, of CRISP or Bloomberg or Capital IQ data on the market. Um, as opposed to reading what somebody wrote last week or put in a sell-side pitch deck. Uh, 
um, that was popular and, and circulating around. And I, I find we come to the most unique and interesting conclusions when it's driven exclusively by the primary source data. In terms of um, reading, um, that's um, I'm also, I think, uh, probably a bit of an outlier there. I have a general rule that Dan makes fun of me that I try to only read things that are at least 50 years old. I, I have a theory that that 99% of human wisdom has already been captured and explained far more eloquently by people that lived prior to the 1950s and 60s than those that um, write today, although there are rare exceptions. Um, and so inevitably, Dan will send me a new article um, or somebody, and, or, and I'll shoot him back a, a version of a, um, one of uh, Plato's dialogues that said the exact same thing, and I thought it said it better. Um, and I think that probably annoys Dan, but... Um, um, no, I, I think on the contrary, I've, I've got, uh, I, I'm literally on my desk, I have this uh, uh, anthology that Nick uh, has been making me read, which which starts with uh, Aristotle and Plato and goes through all the major thinkers. And I, I find it fascinating. I mean, we, 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 I've, I've read uh, under Nick's tutelage, uh, 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 Isaiah Berlin, um, and uh, who I loved and his sort of conception of, of pluralism and um, Aristotle, I thought was fascinating, and Karl uh, Popper. Uh, uh, Popper is just on Hayek uh, and uh, Feyerabend on scientific method, uh, and uh, uh, gosh, I mean, it's it, it's just I, f- I find the the and 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 I think the the philosophy um, is so fascinating because in some sense, right, um, investing is a game of meta analysis, not analysis, right? It's not about um, necessarily you know how well do you analyze company X or company Y. Um, it's much more about how do you analyze the company relative to how everyone else analyzes it, or how does your worldview shape your a whole set of actions? You know, what are the rules that dictate your behavior? And so I think reading philosophy um, is a really interesting way to push yourself to think, well, how do the great thinkers think about these questions, which are, are so similar in some ways to investing about how to set rules for life or rules for living, and how do those apply to investing um, is something that I've been thinking a lot about. And I might add, I might add um, you know, as a, as a deep value investor, um, what our firm does is essentially contrarian in, nation, in nature. We're, you know, at, at its essence, we're betting against the overly uh, pessimistic consensus views on some of these companies. And so um, it, I think it's very, very helpful um, to study what that consensus view is just to understand it. But um, in terms of actually predicating your investment decisions on it, I would be more alarmed if, if we thought similarly to everybody else in the market about the companies we owned. That's interesting. Thanks for sharing. A few other questions that are more in the fun category that I love to ask people are, if you had to retire and work outside of the field of finance, what do you think your dream job would be? Um, well, uh, I personally, you know, love what I do. So it probably is my dream job, but I've, I've, um, I think, I think, uh, uh, you know, I wrote a, a history book about a slave revolt uh, in in New Orleans, uh, and uh, I loved every process. Of, you know, every part of that process of the, sort of the deep archival historical research, the you know constructing the the narrative. Um, uh, and I think I, I you know I probably would love to uh, you know retire to some uh, cabin in the woods somewhere, and uh, as long as I had access to a really good library and. Uh, research and, and and write, and I'd probably you know do more on American history. Although you know recently Nick has gotten me so uh, jazzed about philosophy that uh, maybe I'd be tempted to write some sort of uh, philosophical thing about American history. But so, somewhere in the intersection of American history and um, and and you know I think uh, there's a, a cool uh, field that I've been reading in. Uh, it's called Cleometrics, which is essentially the application of quantitative inquiry to uh, study of history. It was really pioneered by this guy Douglas uh, North, uh, who's a really you know brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, but I think there's a lot there to subjecting historical claims to quantitative evidence and to say, gee, um, uh, I know that everybody thinks that, for example, um, there was something called the Red Scare, where people panicked about um, uh, all these communists in the United States. But then when the Soviet archives opened, you know, it turned out there were a lot of communist spies. So I think there's it would be fun to write something sort of contrarian. Uh, in American history of comparing sort of the narrative that's been spun uh, to sort of what the quantitative or empirical evidence uh, in reality suggests about what happened. Uh, so I think that would probably be my, my, my dream job outside of investing. Uh, I don't know. What about you, Nick? I, I used to be uh, in the uh, Marines as an infantry officer. And um, that's kind of, that was a dream job for me. Um, 
And um, there's not really much else that compares to that um, outside of the Marine Corps. I mean, it's just an incredible peer group and a unique profession where you're kind of given at the age of 23 uh, an amount of responsibility for both people and strategy and strategic thinking that um, would be hard to um, reach at a similar age group anywhere else. And, um, you know, but unfortunately, it's um, a young blood um, organization. And, you know, once you pass 30, it's, you know, your knees and your back give out. So you have to find something else elsewhere. Um, I was also a teacher and I, I love doing that. Um, but the, the I think the more frustrating thing with publishing in certain academic fields is, you know, you, you can write your ideas and you're hopefully they're right, but it's um, it's not necessarily necessarily a sure shot that you're going to, you know, impact the you're 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 going to be able to foresee the fruits of that labor. Um, and you can also be right. And, um, you know, it have very little impact. And I thought I found that was kind of frustrating in my initial attempts to publish um, on constitutional law. And then um you know, so I thought um, in, after business school, you know, what is a profession that kind of, you know, matches my demeanor and my desires? And I found on it, I found that um, being an, a small niche actively managed hedge fund a portfolio manager, it's um, remarkably similar to um, the Marines in a lot of aspects in the sense that, you know, as, as an officer there, it's extremely high risk and high reward. Um, you're given complete discretion. Uh, you have to in, engage in a significant amount of meta-analysis. Um, of, of both your competitors and the people around you. Um, and ultimately, you're, you're, you're responsible for the bottom line of all of your bets, and you can see the fruits, um, fruits of those decisions in, in real life. And I found that's a pretty unique thing in the hedge fund space, which is, is difficult to find in, in like the investment banking, which I was doing before, or in academia. Um, and so as, as far as the options are out there that... Uh, uh, for me today that don't involve carrying a 80 pound pack, I'd say the hedge fund is, is a pretty good fit. Well, I know if Nick ever gets too bored or frustrated, we'll just open up the, uh, for dad, uh, Afghanistan office. <laughs> Another tangentially related question is if you had to stop managing your own money, you could continue to work at for dad, just not with your own money and give your money to an outside investment management firm or individual, or it could be an individual stock. Uh, who would it be and why would you choose them? Uh, you know, uh, uh, this is sort of my, uh, you know, uh, the way that my uh, father raised me, actually. Uh, uh, my, 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 my father um, invested uh, all of his uh, savings um, in Vanguard starting in the 1970s when he graduated from law school. Uh, and uh, so I, I confess to being a lifelong um, fan of, of Vanguard and uh, and Jack Bogle, and uh, I, I would say that uh, you know if 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 uh, if I uh, passed away or and or Nick uh, 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 passed away and couldn't manage our strategy, you know, uh, uh, I would tell you know my 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 family to put all their money in Vanguard. What about you, Nick? Uh, in terms of investment strategies, I, I think the, the both what we recommend to our parents and others is the vast majority um, should be in passive products. Um, that that, um, that said, in terms of who I'd give my money to, I, in any um, any any day you ask me, I might have a different answer. And you're asking me the day after uh, after tax returns, so um, you know I might be particularly biased this day to fund some sort of organization that uh, like Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, but <laughs> any other any other day of any other day of the week, I might give you a different answer. Yeah, could could, could we offer offer sure. anyone other than the United States government? <laughs> But my, my answer any other day than after after mid uh, April is uh, is, would be a different charity probably. Okay, well my last question and I ask this to everyone is if our listeners want to learn more about Verdad and what you guys are doing, where can they find you and learn more? Yeah, so we, we write actually a lot. We write a weekly research piece, and if our uh, if if your listeners would like to sign up for our um, weekly research piece, um, they can either um, find the sign up link through my Twitter. Uh, profile, which is at for dad cap. Um, or, you know, we can also send you a link, uh, Nicholas to include with this podcast, but that's the best way to get to know us and learn about what we do. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time today, guys. It was a, uh, it was a great conversation and uh, thanks again for being on the show. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode, everyone. I invite you to check out our website at sureinvesting.co, see our premium investment research at suredividend.com and also check us out on YouTube where we publish videos under the name sure dividend. See you next time. 